just a, a couple of um, um, I'm just going to mention I uh, located in my research I'm a kind of um, a hidden uh, Kojevian uh, Alexander Kojev who was very influenced on uh, uh, influential on Lacan I, I found five letters that Lacan wrote to Kojev during the 30s when he was a student in the class so I thought I'd make a photocopy of that and share that with you since we're going to go later in the semester uh, uh, to uh, Lacan's four fundamental concepts and the reworking and the return to Freud in a way um, so um, in, in a very radical way um, the more I reread uh, Lacan the more radical I think he is up until you know a certain period but we'll, we'll talk about what, that when we get there um, so yeah, I, I did discover that, and uh, I also got letters of uh, Kojev to Stalin. So uh, Lacan's writing to uh, to uh, Kojev, and and, uh, and uh, Kojev is writing to Stalin during the same period. <laughs> so uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so um, and anybody that tells you uh, uh, Lacan wasn't uh, connected to the left, they're they're lying. It, you know, it wasn't just this. Uh, figure that was outside for the psychoanalytic purposes. One of his best friends and very influenced was, was uh, George Pulitzer, who was interrogated by the Gestapo and ultimately killed by the Gestapo. He would name names, and he used to laugh in their face every time they'd ask him for a name. Uh, you know, it was the, the story about George Pulitzer, who wrote the element for the, uh, a materialist uh, psychology, very, very influential on Lacan during that period. And of course, Lacan's, you know, attending Kozhev's lectures, who was a member of the, the CP, you know, <laughs> of the Soviet Union, really, and was operating in, uh, in France, both uh, pre-Vichy and during Vichy, and then turned. You know, you guys know Kozhev at all? I mean, this is a very, very important figure in the history of uh, Hegelian Marxist uh, studies, and then someone who went the other way, so to speak. Uh, you know, he kind of went from being a um, very militant uh, Marxist materialist to uh, becoming uh, an, advocate, uh, an advocate for Japanese snobbism. <laughs> he thought the Japanese culture was the only culture that was really worth emulating. He found America to be an example of crass communism, and he thought Europe was completely decimated. After, you know, in the 50s, he started to think this way, particularly up until the, his death in 68. Ironically, he died in May of 68. Um, so, um, um, anyway, but a very interesting uh, figure and, and someone uh, very connected, if you with, will, to the, uh, the French, um, you know, psychoanalytic community, particularly Lacan, who was really not, you know, embedded in the community at the dominant factions of the community, but was certainly a, a member of it uh, at that period, or during that period. So anyway, um, so today I wanted to um, maybe begin with the essay uh, of Freud's, the 1915 um, essay on the unconscious, and I was going to just say this. Um, um, I want to go back uh, to and then read the 19. 14, and we can post this uh, on narcissism. That essay, I want to read that as well uh, for next week. And I'm thinking about uh, uh, probably two, uh, three more essays of Freud, which could be read alongside of Ricoeur, and also how someone like Lacan will go back to an essay, how he reworks, particularly the unconscious that we're reading today, as well as the theories of, of narcissism and you know as, as most of you know you probably heard the clinical diagnosis that I mentioned last week that narcissism and the borderline personality is kind of the DSM everybody's catch-all category <laughs> for people that can't or stuck and can't move or, or whatever so we'll, we'll talk about that both in the, uh, in the clinical sense and also in its, its uh, sense for um, um, the development of the mirror stage in Lacan and, and, uh, and, and going forward with that. Another thing I want to do too, just to put up, I mean, uh, I, I, I did a lot of work on Lacan over the week. I just went back. I just want to put up the four uh, fundamental concepts yeah. here. Michael, this is terrible. Yeah. yeah, do you have another one? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 
Yeah, they have another one. I, don't, I didn't bring my own. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. Yeah. Maybe I'll write in red, huh? Yeah, maybe. Michael is better. Yeah. Oh, he's got one. Who does? He. <laughs> What do you need? Yeah. Uh, no, the marker. Okay. Try that one. So, I mean, this is pretty elementary, but I, I do want to put this up here. Oh, there we yeah, go. This is the real deal. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's good. It's not a permanent one, is it? This is not Freud, this is Lacan's reworking into four fundamental concepts. Which I think it's very relevant retroactively, and we'll talk about this uh, as well. Of course, drive, and the debate is around the translation of the notion of drive in German, Trieb, Trieb right? And uh, this becomes a compositive of need, right, desire, and Lacan's great concept, which has to do with the law and the law of language, demand, in French, demand. All right, so that's the number one thing. This has actually raised many translation problems between Trieb, which was translated by Strachey for many years as instinct, but, you know, drive is really a much more cor correct, uh, correct translation. And um, at the same time, um, Bruno Bettelheim used impulse in a book called Freud and the Soul. So the German reading the German, right? And then, you know, this reworking by Lacan, Frenchman reading German. So as the drive, and, and, and this opens up a whole new set of categories in, in Lacan, need is physical and it's about survival. Uh, of course, desire is rooted in the uh, unconscious as a refer referential concept, always. It has a referential content. And then demand is really the, the language that you get out of law. It's a demand for love in one hand and also the appeal to the other. So this is always working in the drive for Lacan. Freud, in a way, is much more closer to the biological in some ways, but his distinction, instinct, was about animal psychology, you know, really was about the animal more, you know, whereas drive referred more actively to kind of biological doctor drives, you know, in a sense, right? So we have this too. Um, the drive was really bodily energy in Freud, if you want to read Freud as a biologist, right? As a, as a biological model. Animal versus biological? No, animal versus human. Yeah, the drive had a motivational aspect to it, whereas instinct was more you know, just pure, purely uh, survival, right? So, um, um, and and the drives for Freud were much more bodily energy. Lacan makes this into a much more of a, I think, a much more sophisticated reworking, right? Into a, tr a three-tiered uh, kind of notion of of need, uh, which I I read here. Uh, this is my reading too. This is Spinoza's Conatus, the drive for self. Preservation, right? The gonatus, the force to live, the force for self-preservation, and uh, um, you know, some of you may know that uh, Lacan, who's 16 years old, is mapping out the ethics in his bedroom. So he had a very long history with Spinoza, as did Freud in a different way, you know. So, um, um, so anyway, um, that's that's one of them, and. Um, and we're going to talk about this because I do want to go to um, the Beyond the Pleasure Principle. There will be another uh, reading we'll do, maybe just a section from that. But Freud gets out of this the dualism of eros thanatos, right? And, uh, you know, which becomes part and parcel of Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Where does the aggressivity come from? And Freud locates this somewhat in the drive, right? So we'll, 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 we'll talk about this. And then you have causes of desire, but I'll go over this more when we get to Lacan, but one thing always to remember is you have uh, the void, the voice, the gaze, and then ultimately in Lacan the phallus, but we'll, we'll, we'll speak to that when we get there. It's, I don't want to get too, uh, too out, out of uh, the Freudian realm, uh, or at least uh, 
directly the unconscious, right, in a sense. So again, um, um, this is, you know, certainly one of the major, major um, um, principles, and, and we're going to talk about this because the idea here is what is psychoanalysis, both for Ricoeur, Freud, and Lacan, it's the science of the unconscious. This is what its object is. So this is what we're going to talk about today. It is the fundamental, you know, if you will, investigation into what is the unconscious, how does it work, you know, and the multiple, you know, permutations around this around this term. Uh, to, 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 uh, this is for Freud, Lacan, and well, this is uh, uh, this is of uh, all three uh, thinkers what here. This is Freud, right? And we're reading the, today the 1915 essay on the unconscious. Um, Lacan basically says, if there's a science, it's going to be a science of the unconscious. This is what Freud is basically saying as well. I'm, well this is our object under investigation. And, and thirdly, Ricoeur is trying to look at what is the fundamental grounding, if you will, of psychoanalysis outside the natural sciences, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. Even though the method is very different, and this becomes a bone of contention between them, what I'd like to develop during the next several weeks is the contentions between a Ricoeurian hermeneutic phenomenological approach to the Lacanian analytic and ultimately set up this dialogue, if you will, between the philosopher who thinks about psychoanalysis as a science and a science of the unconscious, and a clinical practitioner and a theorist of what the unconscious is and how it works. And of course, then the dialogue I would like to have at the end is between reconstruct the Vagilian <coughs> Lacanian a dialogue. I was going to give you a section from being in an event on Lacan so that you can be a little more contemporary about this ongoing thing. This is one of the reasons that obviously the science, Lacan ultimately wants to mathematically formalize the unconscious. This is where he goes to what he calls the mathemens, the methemes, later in his, in his career. So he's really trying to make this into a science itself, you know, to, to give a mathematical formalism to Record does not go that, that way. I just want to show, you know, somewhat that there's a major difference between these uh, two major, uh, you know, French uh, theorists. Um, of course, the other uh, fundamental concept that we've been talking about it is the unconscious, right? And uh, then repetition. And I said last week that I'd like to read as well, uh, uh, remembering, repeating, and working through as another classic text that, that speaks to this. So repetition, and repetition actually leads to identi identity. You know, and we can talk about this as well in identificatory schemas, right? And then finally, and this is where a lot of the trouble becomes, begins, <laughs> transference, right, et cetera, that the, um, the transference basically triggers unconscious into what Lacan will call specular relations, right? This is when you begin to move from the unconscious to the pre-conscious. So this is a, a trigger, right, that the analyst on uh, experiences into what is called specular relations. And this is where going back, when we begin to read the essay on narcissism, from 1914 here, um, we'll begin to see that at work. I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the mirror stage there too. Okay, so I mean these are four fundamental concepts I'd like people to hold in mind. I mean this is from Lacan's Seminar 11 of 1964, uh, you know, where he kind of lays out, you know, his reworking of the, the Freudian uh, field and the terrain and uh, uh, and obviously, this becomes, you know, synonymous with the Freudian discovery, right? That you, without this, you don't have it. Right? <clears throat> and as I mentioned last week, and we're going to hopefully see this at work today, is the censor. Uh, and as I, again, Jean-Paul Sartre, in terms of his arguments from an existential phenomenological point of view, 
and, and, and take. It says, how is it that the, the unconscious exists if the sensor knows what's to let in and what not to let in? This was part of his argument. I think it's a pretty, you know, short, short <laughs> argument in, in a way. Uh, as I mentioned, Sartre said at the end of his life, the last 10, 15 years, yes, the unconscious does exist. <laughs> so he came kind of around, you know, after, you know, I guess a lot of amphetamines and <laughs> <laughs> you know, on that big work of the uh, idiot of the family <laughs> and all of this. So anyway, um, so this is the thing. So the object of the study really, again, uh, and for us too, um, I mean, crucial for us is, you know, obviously James Jameson has written a book, The Political Unconscious. We have a cultural unconscious. Now we probably have a, a work unconscious. <laughs> we have an identity unconscious. We have so many levels of this unconscious that we're going through now. So I think this is a very crucial, again, essay to begin with, as well as a term that we need to, you know, rethink in many ways. When Bernard Stiegler, you know, as I, I said last, speaks about narcissism, he wants to go back to an e even earlier narcissism than Freud and Lacan, which he calls primordial. He says the problem in terms of, quote, therapy for the future is there's no auto-affection, which is a Kantian term. You know, there's not really a love of the self. There's not an affection. And we'll, we'll maybe look at Stiegler in relation to self-psychology of Heinz Kohut and other people, maybe to see that extension as well. Because I, I personally, the more I think about this, the older I get, I find that you know psychoanalysis does become kind of a master discourse, right? Uh, you know, philosophy is very important alongside, and I'm kind of with by you on this. But the more I think about it, you know, the more we need these kind of categories. And um, uh, you know, in order to go into the future for greater understanding, is that we're not getting it from anthropology, we're not getting it from literature, and in a way, the thing that uh, Lacan and Record, in his own way, who wrote heavily on narrative, you know, I recommend his book on. Have you read this book on narrative? Or? No. Okay. Time and narrative, Time and narrative is a really wonderful three-volume uh, study of. Uh, what narrative is, right? right? He also wrote lectures on ideology. So his antagonists have been sort of historically Althusser in ideology, you know, Lacan somewhat on Freud, you know, the philosophy and uh, et cetera. So, but, but anyway, as we move into the, you know, future, these are very, very significant uh, categories, uh, categories uh, to, to really work with. And does such a thing like this in terms of positive and negative really still exist. I mean, you know, all these therapies I hear about, you know, cognitive, behavioral, you know, dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive be behavioral therapy, all these things, these are dominant, right? As is behaviorism in our culture at this point. And this is something that has been pushed to the wayside. You know, part of the problem is this became like Marxism, Marxism of the chair, psychoanalysis became psychoanalysis of the cult, couch and no longer of the culture or, you know, much more than an academic exercise. So it's not like the 30s where you had Freud's free clinics, when you had Wilhelm Reich emerging, these, these kind of people, or the 60s when, you know, there was a real, uh, you know, outpouring of this and, and talk all the time. One of the better books was Marx, Freud, and Everyday Life by Bruce Brown. Uh, was a very good study of the attempted synthesis of the Marxian Freudian moment, which, you know, Lacan is very suspicious of, as is Ricoeur, as is a lot of people today. But, but, but again, um, um, I want to start with this uh, essay on the unconscious, and, uh, and we'll, we'll go back, but th this will at least give you key concepts, and this is not me, this is Lacan, but I mean, I'm certainly on this page, you know, that the drive is always essential. And if you can redrive, and the way he does is a tiered structure between the need, the des desire, and demand, right? This is always operative in any kind of a drive. You know, what does demand mean? means you're appealing for love, you know, or an appeal to the other. You're always looking for, you know, something outside <laughs> to verify, to recognize, etc. Yeah, and I mean, I'll put up another term, but we, we're not going to go here today for a long period of time. But the mec connaissance, 
misrecognition or misknowledging. You know, it's not misunderstanding, it's a misrecognition. Recognition is crucial here, and the relationship, again, to philosophy, and I'll probably do this uh, in detail in a couple of uh, weeks, uh, um, you know, the Hegelian, you know, notion of recognition and the struggle for prestige and how influential this becomes, you know, in terms of uh, psychoanalytic, especially French psychoanalytic theory. But it's in Freud, too, obviously, you know the professional jealousy that you read about in uh, the interpretation of dreams and other things like that. So um, anyway, um, so maybe we can go to the text and do a reading of it. I mean, this is a beautifully crafted uh, 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 text. Uh, unless there are any questions, I mean, what I would like to do uh, on narcissism next, then after that we'll do remembering, <coughs> repeating, working through, and continue with the record as our background today. You know, we'll get try to get some of the place into Freud. You know, I figure it's going to be at least two weeks with this, this kind of stuff. This is, it's dense, and I want to do it as, as thoroughly as possible. Yeah. So, um, okay, so um, what do I do with the text here? This, okay. So, um, The Unconscious in 1915. And, you know, the interesting thing about Freud's writing, number one is that he sets this up very beautifully, I think, by saying, what is the justification for the unconscious to begin with? It's very, very smart this way. It's justification as a term. You know, very, very important to get this in a, in a sense, right? And he says that in the justification, the first important sentence for my, my, my purposes would be the assumption of the existence of the unconscious, this is on the bottom of 116, is necessary and legitimate and that we possess manifold, manifold proofs of the unconscious, the existence of the unconscious. So right away we have almost a scientific claim going on, you know, that there's a proof that such a body, right, <laughs> such a an entity exists, such as the unconscious. It is necessary because the data of consciousness are exceedingly defective, both in healthy and in sick persons. So he's making this distinction. This, this applies to all. It's just not the sick person that has this unconscious and unconscious motivations. Are often Mental acts are often in process which can ex be explained only by presupposing other acts of which consciousness yields no evidence. So to be a conscious subject, we're not going to get any evidence here of these, these, um, um, these um, 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 mental acts that we see both in the healthy and in the sick. And the intimate daily experience and introduces the sudden ideas of the source of which we are ignorant. And here, of course, He's speaking of our parapraxises, you know, our slips, our daily lives of being struck. You know, I've always a phrase I love, I use this with Stanley and another friend of mine, we were astonished to learn. You know, we're always in this moment of astonishment that something strikes us, although you can use it parodically. That's, that's the way it's been used by some people parodically. But, uh, okay, but on the other hand, if we fall, it, they can fall into a demonstrable condition, uh, connection if we interpolate the unconscious acts that we infer. So it appears that the assumption of the unconscious helps us to construct a highly successful practical method, right? So this is obviously what is needed for the practice, practice of psychoanalysis, an absolute presupposition is this notion of the un unconscious, right? So it is both, uh, bottom of the, the paragraph, it is both untenable and presumptuous to claim that whatever goes on the mind must be known to consciousness. So it's very, very interesting. He's against the consciousness industry as we have known it here in the United States early on, you know, later you know, much later than Freud, obviously, 1914. At the same time, all of descriptive psychology of the 19th century. So there are many levels of antagonisms here, you know, that are, that are going on, right? So, then he wants to talk about latency. And I, I mean, maybe I should just ask you, do you have thoughts about this or, you know, background enough in this to see what's going on or what, what uh, how should we proceed? I mean, I can do an explication, but... 
but uh, what, what about this thing about late, late, and late, and late, and uh, uh, is indubitably a residuum of a mental process, but um, you know, ultimately, latency in some ways it becomes only a, a, a nomenclature. For, but for Freud, it takes on a completely different, different notion, right? So again, he's setting the historical record straight. And one of his, I think, one of his uh, 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 essay-like uh, written genius is about that he's able to historically situate himself, right, <laughs> radically against the tradition. This is one of the great moments of Freud against the descriptive psychologist, against the, you know, the dominant uh, strains of psychology in the late 19th and early 20th century, and also justifying you know, the existence of the psychoanalytic, not only the method, but the practice as the study of the, uh, of the um, unconscious. So anybody want to say it? I mean, you know, really up to up to you. I mean, I can yeah, yeah, see yeah, is, yeah. is uh, contrasted with the manifest. Is well, he ultimately does else? that, but he wants to say that latent memory is uh, indubitably a residuum of the mental process. But it is more important to be clear to our mind that this objection is based on the identification of conscious and mental. He is really saying most of our mental processes are unconscious. This is this is one of the first radical insights here, right? That processes that we're we're going through are basically, you know, on the whole unconscious, right? Uh, right. Whereas for most of the tradition, the latent manifest distinction is that the latent can be rendered conscious right away. That is, uh, you know, that um, uh, it's it's conscious, right? It's conscious, right? The latent latency, right? So it's not to be uncovered on earth. It's not part of this, you know, science of the unconscious, right? And so it becomes nomenclature rather than processes. This is interesting because this is something we need to do. For example, um, you know, if you look at uh, Diagnostic Standard Manual, it's a nomenclature. It's uh, written basically for the insurance companies in a lot of ways. I mean, I know it may have some diagnostic, you know, capability and all of this, but in general, it's a nomenclature, right? It's not something that really talks about processes or, you know, really what can be done, treatment modalities, et cetera. It becomes a, so it's really, in some ways, the, the radicality of this mind, the more I read, you know, here, this is subversive at work all the time, right? Here we're going to take on the nomenclature of, you know, dominant psychology of, 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 of its time, right? So, um, so we may reply that the conventional identification of the mental with the conscious is thoroughly unpractical, right? Unpractical for this practical method now called psychoanalysis that he is, you know, has been 15 years as a, a quote unquote science of the <clears throat> unconscious. You know, psychoanalysis is not really born until the committees are formed, I mean, until 1900, even though it's embryonic very much earlier, you know, but as a, as a, as a discipline and as a, pra as a practice, really not as a discipline, right? And very non-academic in the beginning, is did not go through the universities. The universities took this over in the 19, maybe in the 50s, but certainly in the 80s, you know. Uh, um, when were you at Yale, uh, Richard? Uh, in, uh, I, I never attended Yale. Oh, you didn't attend Yale. Oh, no. I thought you did. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I mean at Yale during the, I mean when I in know, the 80s. yeah, in the 80s, this yeah. became a very dominant academic exercise. You had people, Shoshana Feldman right. and others, the Yale French Studies put out a, uh, uh, a Freud. journal for the French Freud, right, during this period. And then psychoanalysis became institutionalized exactly against what Lacan was not wishing for, <laughs> right? And it became an academic discourse, right? And it became, a, a, again, a, a discourse that literary theory would use and then multiple other disciplines. So this is, this is something that Freud himself is trying to guard against. And I think, you know, this is an outlaw, if you will, <laughs> kind of movement. This is really a, an outlaw movement. You know, the two major outlaw movements of the, of the early 20th century, psychoanalysis and the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. Marxism. Uh, Marxism. Marxism. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, it's the Bolshevik Revolution that made it, you know, into this other that, you know, yeah. And, and both have become academicized. And now, I think in both cases, very forgotten. 
Yeah, that's another thing. That's part of the problem. Even though we're getting this left populism, this is a story about look at mass psychology today. Is is this rising up of the social democrats, the the uh, the SDAs, the, uh, the, uh, the multiple candidates that are now running, the young people, the populism, this people's form? Is this part of a new left populism rather than something that is really guided by theory, history, practice, etc.? You know, is this a, you know another blimp on the on the screen like the Occupy moment? And I think this is something we should keep in mind. You know, and what? Yeah, please. Yeah. I was just yeah, say, yeah. I, I did sleep on couches often at Yale. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, you, 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 that, see what you, what happened? Uh, that, all that <laughs> academicization uh, started that way. Okay. <laughs> There's a chapter in, um, I think it's in Norman O. Brown's book, uh, Life and Death. Life Against Death, uh, Couch and Culture is one of the, the, the titles. And then Philip Reif wrote uh, The Triumph of the Therapeutic. And one thing we can keep in mind politically is that the therapeutic, you're, you're hot don't or? Work, don't work. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, the, uh, the, ther the triumph of the therapeutic usually happens that there's a movement towards Freud during times of anti-communism. You know, that the 50s became a real movement uh, for the Freudian moment, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah? you wanted to say something? Mm -hmm. David, yeah. No, 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 no. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 1950s, there was this return to Freud, right, in terms of the neo-Freudian movements, as well as this, this, you know, kind of cultural assimilation, et cetera. And there were a few rebels, like, um, you know, what was his name, Richard um, uh, Linder, Rebel without with a cause, you know the 50-minute yeah, session. Yeah. These kind of people, yeah, et cetera. But a very, very few. A couple of meta works like Marcusa, Norman O. Brown, et cetera. But in general, it was a way of a you know <laughs> moving whatever intelligence one had outside political insurrection into you know trying to g gather greater self-understanding or a way of hiding as well from the anti-communist threat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to say, yeah, in the yeah. 50s, uh, you know, it's very popular, but it's ego psychology. Mm -hmm. And one of the things Heinz Hartmann starts by saying is that up until now, psychoanalysis has been interested in, um, let's say, uh, other than normal pathologies, and we are going to theorize the normal. So in a way, ego psychology right. kind of constructs um, a notion of the normal emphasizes right. uh, the ego, and the ego is the source of health, whereas Lacan will see it as a source of, of, uh, of illness or of defense and resistance. Paranoia. Paranoia. Yes, indeed. And right. also the erasure uh, by ego psychology of the death drive, which for them becomes right. a completely right. aberrant notion. Right, right. This so thing here, yeah. just to go back, and uh, very well, well done. Um, this here, the death drive itself, the sign of the cross, the Greek word, right? And, and uh, this was really written out of the equation, right? This alongside of libido, right? <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this and, and this together, desire and the death drive, which is elementary Kojev, by the way. You know, this is Kojev in the introduction to the reading of Hegel. Right. Uh, and really, in a way, Freud, beyond the pleasure principle, too, um, uh, this was really written out of most of the psychoanalytic, uh, um, um, you know, um, well, at least the hierarchy, of, as you said, Hartman, and certainly the neo-Freudian movement, who were really more in involved in adaptability. You know, as I mentioned last week, I know your boss is shit, tell me more, but you're going to have to cope. Right? This, this was always the, the, the phrase, you cope, you adapt. You know, and in a way, it's a kind of a, you know, an, a, 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 a banal reading of Darwin, too. You know, that your adaptability of the species rather than the real struggle for existence, you know, in a sense. So you can... Now you know, Thanatos say, has marshaled itself with capitalism and fictive capitalism and self so that the late capitalism is a th Thanatos, a death drive. Lacan would not agree with that, but, but, oh, but I yeah. hear what you're saying. I mean, that, that's sort of what 
some people are saying that capitalism is on this death drive and full of death wishes and all of that. Certainly. But that's not exactly uh, Toward the Anthropocene yeah. through fictive capital. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, okay, we'll come back to that in a second. Yeah, please. No, I, was, I was just thinking in the yeah. 50s, you also had the, um, the, the authoritarian personality right. in the Frankfurt School and the, you know, the reaction to you know, the rise of fascism, et cetera. But um, it actually laid the groundwork, I think, for more of a uh, conformism thing. If, you know, it's, if you didn't conform, you know, you were labeled an authoritarian personality or, you know, yeah. all, all kinds of mythology. And you could almost say that there's a line between that and the so-called deplorables of, because, you know, it really was a basically a liberal, I think, uh, in the end, a little, kind of a liberal manual for, uh, you know, mental hygiene, you know, ridding, ridding oneself of authoritarian you mean Hillary Clinton's the bottle of mental health? <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, no, yeah. Was, uh, yeah, yeah, I see. She was, yeah. uh, you know, one of the... I mean, the, the, the thing about the conformism, I mean, most of you probably know the play Rhinoceros by Ionesco. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, everybody turns into the rhinoceros. Everybody turns rat during the you know, McCarthyism or, you know, in terms of ego psychology. That fits very nicely with Richard was talking about in the 50s, how this became even more pronounced, even though it starts much earlier, as you know. Um, it, 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 it really feeds the authoritarian personality in a way. The ego, you know, is, is, is everything, right? Uh, you know, ultimately, yeah. yeah. Also, the DSM comes out of uh, uh, the first, it's a nosology that's created for American soldiers during the Second World right. War. Mm -hmm. Um, so Wartime neuroses. Right. And, yeah. So there's a metaphor of war. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about the Cold War, right. but of the of the notion of the necessity for a kind of uh, of uh, unity of thought. Right. You could say, in terms of conformism, you know, the fact that there's this metaphor both in Cold War, the DSM right. being a nosology first for soldiers, right. then transferred to the uh, civilian patient population with. Uh, ironically, some progressive ideas behind it. You know, they, but originally, you know, some of them was a notion of uh, changing American society and such. So right. there's there there is a kind of impulse that's finally driven down. And and the other thing I would just mention in terms sure. of uh, of uh, diagnosing what you were saying about insurance is so important yes. because whereas in psychoanalysis you might not know what a person, you might not, you know, you've just met a person. Right. You know, you don't know for, it's a, there's, so there's an idea of not knowing necessarily who you're talking with. Uh, Insurance-wise, you to, to get reimbursement, the first time that person walks in, you gotta give them a diagnosis. Yes, right. So it, it immediately demands this mm. kind of relationship of the power right. of knowledge and a diagnosis, right. which is completely antithetical. Right to a, a more open and inquiring very, very relationship good point. to yeah. the person yeah. you're with. And another reason why psychoanalysis is not a treatment modality, right. too, Absolutely. because the, the insurance companies don't cover it, number one. You know, it's become, as I put on the little blurb for this course, you know, a luxury for, a, you know, an upper class, you know, basically at, the, at this point. I mean, it's really, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know what Alan Bass ch charges, for example. He was a Johns Hopkins, or, you know, there, you know, and he teaches, you know, at the new school occasionally. But I mean, you know, anyway, this is not affordable for the, the people that could really use it, too, in, in a certain way, you know, in a way. I mean, we're not seeing Jared Kushner's head being turned around by some psychoanalyst on Park mm -hmm. Avenue. That's pretty well, clear, that right? Horror, yeah. 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 I'm sorry? And that would be a horror. Yes, yeah, so a horror to see what that head looks like. Sure. Yeah. 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 In terms of right. psychoanalysis, right. I'm doing my, my taxes, <laughs> looking, to, looking to see what I, I can get an exemption for. Right. And you can get an exemption for psychoanalysis, but only for medical purposes, quote unquote. What does that mean? I'm sorry? It means if you want to know yourself better, forget it. <laughs> oh, I see. Only for medical purposes? What, what does psychoanalysis have to do with medical purposes? Well, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. that's another I mean, part of the yeah. American Yeah, the Americanization yeah. of psychoanalysis yeah. the, is the medicalization. The right. MDs right. Right. Uh, yeah. really making a concerted effort to right. take control right. and to get rid of the lay analyst. Right. 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, Theodore Reek was Freud's, uh, you know, trying to right. save him in terms of the question of lay analysis against the medical, the AMA, and the, the profession. So most people that became psychoanalysts in this country were MDs up until, uh, you know, up until him, really, and in a way, a lot of the institutes did not pick up on this right until just recently, right? I mean, the last 30, 35 years or so. Which horrified yeah. Floyd in some ways because, again, as you were saying last yeah. time, yeah. I watched the video. Oh, you did. Okay. The cultural, yeah. you know, a rich cultural background. Yeah. You know, these MDs were largely focused on medical and right. not, did not, knew nothing about books or music or philosophy right. Right. or anything else. Right. Like, right. you know, so it was the erasure of that deep, rich, you know, Freud who knew Goethe and Shakespeare and, you know, that uh, kind of sense of yeah. formation was, yeah. was basically erased. Which, which logically follows why psychoanalysis in terms of academic disciplines would go into literary departments. Right, it did not go into other departments and, and very, you know, maybe a little bit in the psychology departments, you know, I mean, Freud became obviously household and, and uh, domesticated, et cetera, in these departments, but it was the literary departments that really opened up, <laughs> right, this this uh, yeah. this field. And, and Lacan did not come in through psychology, did not come in through, you know, um, um, even philosophy. I mean, there was some talk, you know, in the beginning because, you know, he gave that famous uh, 1966 talk in Baltimore. Uh, where it was attended by many philosophers and others, where uh, I mentioned last week the best image of the unconscious. I agree with this, the best image of the... Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I spent didn't go to there. Yale, but I was born at Johns Hopkins Hospital. <laughs> there, you go, there you go, all right, good, 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 good. good, good. <laughs> Let's not forget yeah. that Freud was a medical doctor himself. Right, right. Well, he started he as a neurologist. He doing surgery on yeah. the eyes. Yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. And I mean, the whole time with uh, Joseph Breuer, who he, he mentions many times here, the studies in hysteria and the use of hypnosis are very important for this discovery of the unconscious, you know, in, in, in his way. Or the un unconscious as a science, as, a, as becoming a new science. How do we look at this in many ways? So, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess our, our question in some ways in reading this again is, you know, how much of this really fits logically into a paradigm, if you will, or an epistemological construct that we can really say, okay, yes, this really exists, right? <laughs> this is something we want to take up always. You know, we want to talk in the language of displacement. We want to talk in the language of, you know, transference. We want to talk about, you know, what's going on in terms of the return of the repressed, <laughs> you know, working through a neurosis or working through a cultural but it problem. It yeah, veers yeah, on yeah. maybe not quite a scientism, right. but the desire to locate something in a science is I, I think makes it well, lose something. When you say science of the unconscious yeah. is what Lacan will do, and I think Freud would agree with this, you're really saying it's a knowledge of the unconscious. It's a new knowledge. So I don't think it's really being made into quote unquote what we understand as scientism or the regular usages of the term science. So, you know, it's kind of a, like a knowledge. You know, this, this, this is a, a question, does this become an epistemology? Can this really be put into the thinking about the more general categories of epistemology going forward, right? In, in, in many ways, and you know, and and again, the, the the thing here is, you know, you read a piece like this, and you have to ask the question, like Ricoeur, and I think this is one of Ricoeur's great insights. There's a big difference between doing a commentary, right, on something and an interpretation, and what is this art of interpretation? And is there such a thing as a science of interpretation? That's ultimately what, what we're really trying to look at here, you know, and, and for our own purposes, you know, uh, yeah. That's Do where it comes into literary departments, literature departments, because it's a hermeneutic. Yes, yes, but I mean, you know, uh, again, is Freud a hermeneutician? I mean, we're going to keep this question going. I mean, I hear you. I but so. is this, is this a, a hermeneutic in the sense that hermeneutics was developed? I mean, Heidegger, for example, one of the great thinkers of the hermeneutical circle, 
no such thing as psychoanalysis and no science and that, no, no truck with it at all, right? Yeah, at all. So, uh, you know, is Lacan and is Freud in their analytical categories in their, because analysis literally means, analysis means to undo something. And you're in this constant undoing of something. Is their analytical method different than the hermeneutical method? You know, in a way. This, and this is an old debate in Judaic culture between um, Maimonides and Spinoza <laughs> in terms of reading scripture. You know, the Maimonides have these allegorical ways of reading. You know, again, this is a question of reading versus the Spinozas, which was much more the art of analytical interpretation line by line. So, you know, these, these are real, real questions, right, uh, going forward. And then, of course, we have, you know, Kojev's friend, who he, he, met, he, he stayed in touch with, and I don't like this person at all, but I think it's important because he's very dominant in many philosophy departments and in state departments, Leo Strauss. Mm -hmm. You know, the Straussian theories of reading that basically philosophers are, are, have a hidden agenda always, <laughs> and they're always covering up something in their historical moment. You know, you're not really reading Descartes just as a skeptic or a radical skeptic <laughs> who discovers the cogito, there's something else that's going on there, right? In a sense, in terms of the birth of modern subjectivity. So I hear what you're saying, but I mean, I want to keep this an open thing. Interpretation, one art of interpretation is certainly is, is the, um, is the um, um, uh, hermeneutical, right? And this is where we're called. One of the reasons I wanted to read this, because this is the, the best of the quote-unquote hermeneutical studies <laughs> of, of, of Freud, right? This is not, not just an explication, it's an essay really on interpretation. And I think Jameson, you know, in The Political Unconscious, if you've read, how many of you read Jameson's? Yeah, it's a, it's a book really worth reading, uh, uh, especially not the literary essays, but the first 90 pages are a meditation on interpretation, a Marxist inter a notion of interpretation. And you know, Jameson uh, experienced Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis, so for, for the record, you know, in a sense. So uh, he has, uh, you know, he has a lot of background there with uh, these, uh, these people. So um, anyway, um, so the justification here, I mean, he goes through, I mean, the, the, the notion of the hypnosis on the other time, that through his studies in hypnosis, going back to Freud, to the text here, he, he discovered that there is an unconscious when they looked, you know, they did these studies. This is on page uh, 110. The stubborn denial of the mental quality of the latent mental process must be accounted for by the circumstances that most of the phenomena in questions have not been objects of study outside psychoanalysis. This is uh, 119 in uh, uh, the text, and it's still in the, uh, the section on justification. Anyone who is ignorant of the facts of pathology who regards the blunders of normal persons as accidental and is content with the old saw that dreams are froth, need only ignore a few more problems of the psychology of consciousness in order to dispense with the assumption <coughs> of unconscious mental activity. <clears throat> as it happens, hypnotic experiments, which he did plenty, and especially post-hypnotic suggestion, which, you know, as you know, he was attending Charcot's you know, rounds on a weekly basis, had demonstrated tangibly, even before the time of psychoanalysis, the existence and mode of operation of the unconscious in the mind, right? So he's basically saying, you know, these experiments that he did and that Charcot did earlier than him with hysterical uh, women actually show that there was an unconscious. At, uh, he could have used hysterical men. Well, we'll do that in the future. But we, we all know the story of the staging of the, the rounds at Hôpital de Saint in Paris, OK? So um, the assumption of an unconscious is, moreover, in a further respect, a perfectly legitimate one insofar as that postulating it, we do not depart a single step from our customary and accepted mode of thinking. By the medium of consciousness, each one of us becomes aware only of his states of mind that another man possesses consciousness is a conclusion drawn by analogy from the utterances and actions we perceive him to make. And it is drawn in order that this behavior of his be, may become intelligible to us. It would probably be psychologically more correct to put it this way, and this is good Freud, right? That without any special reflection, we impute to everyone else our own constitution. 
<laughs> we think they're like us, right? <laughs> and therefore also our consciousness and that this identification is a necessary condition of understanding in this. This conclusion or identification was formally extended by the ego to other human beings, to animals, plants, inanimate uh, matter, and the world at large, and proved useful as long as the correspondence with the individual ego was overwhelmingly great. But it became more trustworthy in proportion as the gulf between the ego and the non-ego widened. Today, our judgment is already in doubt on the question is this of consciousness in animals, we refuse to admit it in plants, and we relegate to mysticism the assumption of its existence in inanimate matter. But where, even where the original tendency to identification has withstood criticism, that is, when the non-ego is our fellow man, the assumption of a consciousness in him rests upon an inference and cannot share in the direct certainty we have of our own consciousness. Now, psychoanalysis demands nothing more than we should apply this method of inference to ourselves also, a proceeding to which it is true we are not constitutionally disposed. If we do this, we must say that all acts and manifestations, which I notice in myself and do not know how to link up with the rest of my mental life, must be judged as if they belong to someone else and are to be explained by the mental life ascribed to that person. Further, experience shows that we understand very well how to interpret in others how to fit into their material mental context those same acts which we refuse to acknowledge as mentally conditioned in ourselves. Some special hindrance evidently deflects our investigations from ourselves and interferes with our obtaining true knowledge of ourselves. All too easy just to go outside of ourselves and identify in the other. You know how we say, I feel like you, or I went through that experience? I think he, in some ways, is you know, speaking to that here. This method of inference applied in spite of, to oneself, in spite of inner opposition, does not lead to a discovery to an unconscious, but leads logically to the assumption of another second consciousness, which is united in myself with the consciousness I know. So in a way, he's really criticizing, obviously, here, the alter ego, the other ego right in a way, and this is coming out of Fichte, you know, the, who's a, kind of the modern thinker, uh, you know, was a contemporary uh, right before Hegel, uh, post-Kant, of the ego and its development, right? And then you see this also, the ego in its own, and Max Stirner, of which Marx criticizes heavily in the German ideology. So you see what's going on, I mean, he's saying there, the alter ego is not really where we're going here in terms of the science of the unconscious. You know, and this becomes a universal, right? A universal. So it is not a theory of inner subjectivity. It's anti-phenomenological this way, for those of you that know. You know, phenomenology says we are all subjects in here. We have consciousness that are intentional acts. <laughs> we understand each other and we, we communicate through some inner subjective processes. Right through intentional acts, you know, et cetera. This is how consciousness works. Freud is completely anathema to this, completely antagonistic to this view of phenomenology. That consciousness is of something, right, in terms of intentionality. No such thing as a theory of intentionality in Freudian psychoanalysis. Motivation, yes, but not intentionality. And theories of intersubjectivity are always dependent upon that notion of yes, of intentionality and acts of consciousness, and that you have this, that you have this, you know, yeah, yeah. consciousness of, of something, right? Yeah. yeah. And as I mentioned, you weren't here last week. I, don't know, I doubt you wrote the. I did. You did. I oh did. my God. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, I talked a little bit about uh, you know that they're in Brentano's uh, lectures on psychology from an empirical point of view, as well as his lectures on the manifold senses of the word being and Aristotle, Husserl and Heidegger, I mean, Husserl and Freud were in the room. And the joke is that Husserl took this to the transcendental ego way upstairs, and Freud took it to the basement and below, right? <laughs> the manifold senses of the word being, you know, the several senses, right? Is that, I'm, I'm just yeah, thinking yeah, through the, yeah. um, uh, is there a, a point of comparison here between then intersubjectivity and the way that uh, Stiegler uses um, individuation and trans-individuation? 
that, that speaks to yeah. like the presence of the unconscious and yeah that's a that's another uh, uh, I mean I guess another course uh, uh, yeah. yeah no it's okay I mean uh, um, it's, just it's hard to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't think Stiegler is a is a, an active reader, if you will, of Lacan and Freud. I think he knows enough, you know, to, to, to deal with this. I think he comes much more out of the phenomenological tradition. You know, he's coming out of Husserlian and, and certainly Heideggerian hermeneutical phenomenology as, so as, as models asking. of interpretation. Yeah, so Stiegler and the trans-individuation is... Is, uh, is out of Gilbert uh, Simindon, um, who is a, a, a thinker uh, uh, that wrote his, wrote his dissertation, came out of, uh, of uh, Deleuze's uh, yeah. uh, circle, so to speak. And, so that's uh, a way to yeah. think uh, uh, yeah. intersubjectivity rather than a way to challenge intersubjectivity with right. the notion of the unconscious. Right. Right. Trans-individuation is, is yeah. sort of an extension of intersubjectivity. Pro right? Processes of individuation um, uh, in Stiegler are much more indebted to Simendon, right, in terms of this trans-individuation that one's going through. What, what Stiegler sees today that our contemporary alienation is more about disindividuation. This is where we are right now. We're we're in this process of disindividuation. We have no sense of who who you know we are. We've lost the sense of auto affection. You know, we as a generic uh, you know universal for the for the culture we live in. But but anyway, um, and so for him, it's not so much that the unconscious is is at stake, right? <laughs> Uh, it's more that you know, <coughs> this process has broken down, the individuation process has broken down fully in the age of digitalization. So anyway, the relationships that we have now are to machines, and this is why I think Simidon and others have come back. Simidon was not read at all when he was uh, you know, publishing his work and when he was still alive. He's being read because of digitalization now. He's being read because of the, the new... Uh, the new, uh, you know, uh, technologies. This is why why he's being read. You know, in, in the age of digital reproducibility, if you want to extend uh, Benjamin a little bit. Uh, um, and also, uh, yeah. Husserl, uh, Stiegler wor uh, relies on retention and different yes. levels yes. of retention. Right. Yeah, for for Stiegler, memory is different than than what it is. Even though. Both Derrida and Stiegler are dependent on Freud as memory traces and the Nachtraglichkeit, the after effect, you know, and, and the notion of memory trace is, is active. It certainly, I mean, Freud is great on this. And, you know, one essay you, you should read of Derrida is Freud in, the, Freud in the scene of writing. It's a great treatment of, 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 of memory and trace, you know, in the psychoanalytic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freyage. Freyage, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, the, uh, but for, for Stiegler, ultimately, it's a question of, yes, it's the psychoanal, I mean, excuse me, the phenomenological study, retention and protension, right? You know, memory that we have, memory, and then that extension, right? Uh, the, the future, in a sense, right? And that's what's going on in all intentional acts of consciousness. For Freud, this is complete nonsense. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but... This is the way, I mean, say if Freud was here today, he'd, you know, kind of say, no, 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 you're not, you're not looking at what's underneath this in terms of especially this and this, right? Especially one and two of the four fundamental concepts. Can I is the activity is uncommon. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. The, so yeah, I don't was, know if I have answers. No, that, that's, yeah, yeah. That, that was, anyway. that's exactly what yeah, I was asking. Yeah. The, um, so when Stiegler talks about, uh, like, the actions on the memory, like mnemotechnics and stuff like that, he's operating still at the level of like intentional and conscious memories, memories that we know, memories that we're aware of, not at the level of the unconscious. Well, he's, he's in an involvement, he's not presupposing unconscious activity. Okay. So he's, he has a, a project in which the project <laughs> is to, you know, set up a model that is retentional and protentional in the Husserlian sense, right? He's, he's trying to think it through that way. So he's not, he's not Freudian. I mean, he's still again, you know, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not about this, right? And it's not about this. It's about neme, techne, the craft of memory, right, in some ways, and, and the techniques determine us from the outside.
right? Freud is not really only talking about, that's why I say read the scene of writing, because you begin to see the magic writing by the Wunderblock yeah, at work. <laughs> yeah, the little, kids, little... We st People still get them now. They're, they do? They're black, yeah. um, like black clay yeah. material, and there's a, Wunderblock, a, right? a yeah. cellophane yeah. paper that goes over oh, it. You write, right. and you pull, right. I, everybody knows, you pull over the writing and it disappears, right. Right. but it remains on the black. Yeah. Uh, plastic or right. whatever that material is on so, so that it's that's the unconscious yeah so anyway I mean I'm, I know I'm throwing out a lot here but but I'll, I'll do so anyway uh, the, the <coughs> Derrida surature under erasure is really coming out of this too what mm -hmm. is under erasure and what Freud that's very Freudian in the sense that it presupposes the unconscious something is under eraser something is repressed right mm -hmm in this in this moment right of the writing you know the famous story about Thomas Mann with Joseph and his brothers his four volume uh, novel that towards the end of his life and he gave it to Freud to, to read right or you know and and Freud wrote him back a commentary and Thomas Mann said I, I didn't I didn't know I said that <laughs> right so this was always kind of like something about psychoanalysis that you know the idea was you could always read what is the unconscious, you know, saying here? This is, and again, the great insight to me of Lacan is the law of language, or what I put up last last week is the, the unconscious is structured like a language. You know, what does that mean? You know, and what's the role of linguistics? And you know, as you know, in this country, and this is all part of a very old uh, European system of education. We have very few linguistics departments here. There are very few people study linguistics. You know, you know. I mean, you have Chomsky here, but you know, Chomsky's yeah. child's play compared to De Saussure and Jacobson, Jacobson, and some of these other people. Bon Venise, if you read, start reading these people, you know, you begin to see a whole new different level <coughs> of linguistic and interrogation, right? In a sense, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, you know, we, we don't have that, and as I mentioned, to me, still the best book on Lacan and linguistics is Anika Lemaire, which was written 50, almost 50 years. You know this book? Uh, a yes. very, very good book about Lacan and the relationship to language, and uh, yeah. What is the author? Anika Lemaire, which is Belgium. Yeah. Just called Lacan. Chuck Lacan, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very good book. Yeah, very solid. Yeah, yeah, Al, yeah. When I was reading the book, what was it uh, by Stiegler that we studied? Yeah, what was the name <laughs> a of lot of book? people there. That, that was a great book, but it was, yeah. uh, whenever I came across the concept of individuation and trans individual, I, I used to think, maybe I was wrong, I was analogizing with Jung's concept of uh, individuation. No, no, no it's nothing. No, to do very with that? different. All right, different. I, wa I want to get that. Yeah, it's different, out. different than the, the Jungian analogy. analytical psychology uh, tradition. Yeah, it's very, very that. different. Right. No, 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 no. This is much more. I was on the wrong track. Yeah, much more. Yeah. Just uh, the, yeah. even just sure. to take the term individual, <laughs> yes. which means non-divided. Non-divided. Exactly the opposite. Exactly. Of the Lacanian mm. subject That's coming right. from the sussur. The split signifier, the signifier, the signifier. The human being, as as Lacan theorizes, the subject is split. Right. So I mean, the idea of individual is literally incomprehensible. You know, it's yeah. It's actually what he's <laughs> right. dismantling. Right. In a right. sense. Right. Um, and yes. You know, in introducing language, which by which by the way introduces the community, the polis, politics. Absolutely. The, you know, language is come you know it doesn't start with any of us it's pre-exists us so. right that's right that's right yeah yeah instead of lingerie we have lingerie lingerie right this is Lacan's uh, play on language uh, that he did one time in a seminar right typical Lacan anyway for those of you who don't know Bernard Stiegler was a bank robber in a previous <laughs> incarnation. He uh, he uh, was a member of the uh, of the uh, French uh, Trotskyite faction of the uh, the Communist Party. Um, uh, ran a jazz club, loved jazz, and uh, he um, was short capital to keep the George <laughs> the, keep the jazz club going. 
So he robs, uh, starts Five. robbing a few banks. <laughs> After some success keeping the jazz club up, he finally got caught. He was, you know, put in prison, and he began to study philosophy, particularly Husserl. You know, going back to this, um, and he would do exercises of intentional acts of consciousness while in the jail cell. During this period, he he established a relationship with a. Um, 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 philosopher named Grandel, Gerard Grandel, who formed a press called the Trans-European Press, and they communicated by letter and, you know, exchanged letters, and I think Grandel visited him, who then ultimately uh, introduced him to Jacques Derrida. Mm -hmm. Stiegler got out about five years after this, you know, it's a pretty polished philosopher, you know, it's like the guy from uh, Angola prison when he won a George Proko award, told the reporter when she said, how did you do so much research for this award? You know, the Angola, he said, I got nothing but time, baby. But anyway, <laughs> he, he uh, uh, Stiegler, you know, came out, they rushed him through, I think, a degree at the Sorbonne, you know, quickly at the Ecole Normale Superior, you know, and then he became a major philosopher in his own right. He, an ontology, a projected five volumes, Technics and Time, which is his major work, Symbolic Misery, um, you know, he wrote a little book about his experiences. If you want his Freudian stuff, it's called Acting Out, <laughs> you know, to act out or to pass the acting out, so, so to speak. So he's a very important thinker today vis-a-vis, -vis, I think, technology and his concept of the new proletariat is very interesting, that we're all proletariatized because we have lacking in savoir-faire. We don't know how to make anymore, therefore we don't know how to live. You know, and he basically says the whole culture, whether you own property or a lot of property, right, you're proletaritized because you no longer know how to make, make things, etc. So he has this kind of universal thing. He also does not speak of this as great capitalism. He calls this hyper-industrialization, this age, right? He, he actually thinks he uses that term still instead of just technocratic or technology, <laughs> even though he knows. The, the importance of technology. Anyway, it's important in the sense that he has this, this notion of individuation, very different than Carl Jung, uh, that he borrows from, uh, um, from um, um, uh, Gilbert de Simenon, among others. Um, he's very close to Jean-Francois Lyotard, the uh, postmodern uh, condition. He sees a lot of different libidinal economies there that have not really been articulated. He says one of the things that the political economists and the Marxists have forgotten is how to bring a libidinal economy into the equation, in a sense, that this is very under-theorized, <coughs> not talked about. So he has something called pharmacology. Hmm. This is his, 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 his study is of the pharmacology, which he borrows, of course, from um, the reading of the Phaedrus, by Derrida on the pharmacon, that the poison and the remedy are one and the same in the head of the pharmacos, right? Both dispenses the remedy as well as the poison. And really, in a way, that's kind of elementary Freud, too, because you're poisoned <laughs> once the, you know, somehow you're at that level where the unconscious becomes somewhat conscious, right? In the session, right, et cetera. You're, sh you know, you're, you're struck, you're shifted, you know, you're hit. You know, there's no, you come out of an analytic session feeling good, something's wrong, right, <laughs> so to speak, right? So anyway, um, so he, I mean, in a way, without theorizing an unconscious, you know, it's, it's certainly working in, in Stiegler's work around the pharma, pharmacology and the pharmacological as a new form of, uh, of, of understanding the economy. Right, in, in a way, he's, he's very, uh, very active in this. So certainly worth reading. I mean, a good point, starting point to my mind would be on symbolic misery. I think it's a very relevant term for the, our days and et cetera. But a lot of the other stuff is, is certainly worth reading. Uh, one of the great titles is he plays on Max Weber. Capitalism has lost its uh, spirit, or and I translate capitalism has lost its mind. So he has this, uh, you know, uh, you know Hegelian there. mind and spirit. Yes, he plays with that too, and he's also done another states of shock, uh, yeah, that's stupidity, that's, knowledge, and stupidity. That's the book we use. Right? Yeah, we so use that. That's an yeah. excellent book. States of shock. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very good. You know, very good. But again, a lot of these categories are being used, and you know, 
and in between these two in particular. He has a notion of repetition, but that repetition is about nemotechne. And, and in some ways, look, since this is, the, the course is titled Freud and Philosophy, I mean, one could write a, a great essay, and you know, one of the better parts of a Lacanian approach to uh, uh, Plato's symposium was in the French Freud by John uh, Brinkman. And it was called uh, uh, the Symposium on Plato's Symposium, where the where, where the the structure of anonymesis of recollection is really taken up as you know really this is the the the, the repetition the working through is through an anonymic activity, right? Through the recollection, right? you know, which is hard work, right? That's what he's saying. The technology to to Stiegler, is now dominated by nemotechnic, we don't have the hard work anymore. We don't have to walk 20 blocks to find a restaurant. You know, we can get it on the, the, the map, right? We can know, etc. We don't have to do certain things, we can Google. You know the difference between my honor students and my regular students? The I honor students know how to chew, cheat better. They know how to cut and paste better. They're much more sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're dealing with in education now. You know, I noticed this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, Ellie is described. The best story I ever had was some someone came in, gave me a paper in a philosophy class, outright, word for word, verbatim of Kant's preface B, <laughs> the critique of pure reason. <laughs> so I bring the student in. <laughs> sit down, sit down. This is brilliant. Oh I'm looking God. at it. <laughs> <laughs> this is just. I mean, how did you get to? I mean, I've never seen anything less. I mean, but it reminds me of something. Oh, let me show you this book here. I mean, either he's copying you or you're <laughs> copying him. But he wrote this 200 years ago, so I don't think it was right. <laughs> so the poor kid didn't know what to do. So we, we rewrote it in everyday language. But anyway, they try everything. <laughs> like, this is where we are. So anyway, but um, yeah, I recommend uh, uh, reading him. He's very, very good with this, uh, you know, and, and, and in, uh, Did yeah. Stiegler immerse himself in Greek? Because I remember reading that book, Stacey of Shaw, there were so many w technical words of Greek origin. He had I nothing but time for five years. Yeah. He could read Greek, Latin, and <laughs> everything must, else. He yeah. must have yeah. learned Greek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, let, me, let me just go on. Um, he talks about double consciousness <coughs> on page 121. <coughs> uh, we shall, however, be right in rejecting the term subconsciousness as incorrect and misleading. So when people say, I subconsciously did something to Freud, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, this may be pre-conscious, <laughs> right? Yeah, but not, not double. Is, isn't yeah. there a gradation from full consciousness to pre-conscious? I don't think there's ever, he, he never uses full. He never uses full consciousness. No, I know that, yeah, but yeah. I mean consciousness that we, our everyday consciousness is is, is that, and right. then he does use pre-conscious, and why, well, does, why does he skip sub subconscious? In my thinking, maybe I'm, it's getting closer to Well, let's see what he says here. I mean, he's got a whole thing on the pre-conscious yeah. here. Yeah, he, I mean, you know, he goes, I read that. goes in here, you know, on, on uh, the, the consciousness and enduring consciousness and the whole processes of censorship. So anyway, uh, the known cases of double consciousness, splitting of consciousness, prove nothing against our view. They may accurately be described as cases of splitting of the mental activity. And, you know, he wrote a famous piece on the splat on the split, splitting of the ego, too, as well, you know. And uh, uh, two groups whereby a single consciousness takes up its position alternately with either one or the other of these groups. Okay. In psychoanalysis, there's no choice for us but to declare mental processes, and this is him, you know, the axiomatic, right? To be in themselves unconscious and compare the perception of them by consciousness with the perception of the outside world through the sense organs. We even hope to extract some fresh knowledge from the comparison. The psychoanalytic assumption of unconscious mental activity appears to us on the one hand a further development of that primitive animism which caused our own consciousness to be reflected in all around us. And on the other hand, it seems to be an extension of the corrections begun by Kant in regard to our views on external perception. Just as Kant warned us not to overlook the fact that our perception is subjectively conditioned and must not be regarded as identical with the phenomena. This is the old subject-object as well as, you know, 
um, you know, a, a correlative uh, identification at work, but really never really discern so, uh, you know, um, never really discern. So psychoanalysis bids us not to set conscious perception in the place of unconscious mental processes. He's speaking here to the old distinction in Kant between the noemal and the phenomena, that which appears and that which remains hidden, right, in a way. So he is taking up this phenomenal noemal realm uh, uh, at this point vis-a-vis -vis perception. The mental, like the physical, is not necessarily in reality just what it appears to be to us, right? And again, this goes back, as most of you know, to the old reality appearance distinction in Plato, right? <laughs> right? And in, in a sense, that the sun, the world of the sun, does not really illuminate reality for us, right? It's the forms, the ideas, in a sense. He's not Platonist, though, Freud, yeah, very, very materialist. It is, however, so satisfactory that the correction of inner perception does not present difficulty so great as that of outer perception that the inner object is less hard to discern truly than is the outside world. Okay, so this, this is his attempt to look at, you know, something in the history of philosophy vis-a-vis -vis Kant, you know, and, and this is in the Critique of Pure Reason, the section on the phenomena, the phenomena and the new eminal realms. You know, the new eminal always being that which we do not know, thing right? Thing in itself? Yes, thing. and the thing in itself, ultimately, yes. Right, the ding on sick, right, right? Okay, so then the term unconscious, the typographical, the topographical element, uh, the justification, you know, I, I think he gets through pretty well, and then he, he goes on, um, On the bottom of page uh, 122, the two phases interpose the kind of testing process of censorship. In the first place, the mental act is unconscious and belongs to the system, and this is when he begins to develop his topography, right, of the ICS, uh, excuse me, the uh, UCS and the PCS and the CS, right? This is the, the system at work, right? The, the unconscious, the pre-conscious, and the conscious. Okay. If upon the scrutiny of the censorship it is rejected, it is not allowed to pass into the second phase, and this is where Sartre takes his point of departure in terms of his argument against the existence of the unconscious. How does the censor know what to let in or not let in? Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a football game on the <laughs> right. Yeah, anyway. Um, it is not allowed to pass into the second phase. It is then said to be represented, right? Mm -hmm and most remain, re excuse me, re repressed, and thus remain unconscious. If, however, it passes the scrutiny through the censor, the gatekeeper, if you will, it enters upon the second phase and therefore belongs to the second system, which we call the conscious. So these are systems, Al. They're not, this is one of the arguments he had with Jung, that Jung did not have really systems, scientific systems. Freud is really trying to do a science of the mind not just a speculation. I mean, this was part of his, his, his argument with, with Jung, that the really what Jung was doing was a, a speculative, platonic view about only ideation, right, and not really systems of the mind. This was the first of the breaks, you know, from the psychoanalytic. Freud is more trying to be empirical. Well, I think he's both empirical and theoretical. I mean, the theor theory is much more material-based, right? He's looking at this in terms of systems, right? The system of the unconscious system, the pre-conscious system, and the conscious system, right? These are all working as systems. You're, you're really looking at systemics of these systems. Listen, we're never going to know this. We never know this, <laughs> right? This is not, you know, the best we're going to do is try to, you know, pass through the censor, <laughs> like, undo some of the repression or allow some of the repression to, to filter through. We filter it, if you will, then into the conscious mind, right? And then we understand its existence after we begin to understand what was displaced. We do it through struck, language. And we do it through language. We begin to understand ourselves through language. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes. We yes. speak ourselves. We, that, that's our early, yes, homo locans, colloquens is the, the speaking subject. That's what we are. Yeah. For Stiegler, we are the technical subject. Homo loquens. Yeah. right. For, for, for Derrida, we're the written subject. 
right? It's interesting, right? Yeah, but for Lacan and for Freud, the speaking subject, always the speaking. Yeah. Speech and Language and Psychoanalysis, the retitle of the language of the self that Tony Wilden made the, 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 the you know, his, his book that he wrote in the uh, 70s and retitled it, Speech and Language and Psychoanalysis, right? The Language of Psychoanalysis, Jean Laplanche and J.B. Pontalis, right? Always, yeah. So you're right, yeah. And this is where demand comes in, because the appeal is through language and the law of language as well. So this sets up something else. We'll, we'll get to that with Lacan more, you know? He's, he's the one that elaborates this. Yeah, George, yeah. We get that from, from Plato too, right? Though? From who? From, from Plato with the, the, my pronunciation, that's why I'm embarrassed, but uh, it's okay. the, 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 the own lexicon, the, the, the speaking, the, the lexicon that, uh, well, yeah, I mean, this is this is the debate. I mean, this is the reason people should uh, have a, a philosophy, right? The, this begins in the Phaedrus, right? The difference between the the the, uh, the speaking subject and the, and the, and the right, written, right? This is really what it is. And Plato covers up his ears, you know, because the pharmacon is really the written, right? They don't want to hear it. This is where uh, the entire deconstructionist movement, at least in France, takes its point of departure from that text. If you want to study one text alongside, De I mean, I'm, I'm condensing here a lot, but, but it's true in some ways that you, you look at the Phaedrus of, um, of, of Plato, Read it carefully, and then you read the Pharmacon, Plato's Pharmacy of Daddy Da. You'll get a really good sense of all, all the, yeah, yeah. And another reason we need the police so we can learn to speak and be able to speak. Well, speak. Richard's going to, yeah, Richard brought, brought that up earlier. That's where the speaking subject comes in in the polis, right? And where does polemics come from, in a way? That struggle, right? The struggle between the war, you know? Polemus is the father of all things. <laughs> of all things. The splitting that's necessary in order to have language that's already there in this polemos. Yeah. So, yeah, nothing new under the sun under the, the even, Greeks. Even and, polite. Yeah, yeah, they came from another <laughs> planet, these people, in the 5th and 6th and 4th centuries. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Even polite <laughs> comes from Polis, right? Polite, yeah, and police too. Right. Yeah, polite police. Yeah, that's a new slogan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> polite police. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but politesse, right? Every everywhere you go, be be, be politic, politesse, etc. Yeah, no, it's great, great to do this. Again, listen, I, I was lucky enough to have a course in etymology when I was like 15, 16, and you know, you learn a lot through etymology. That's another thing the left could really do in terms of enhancing. Uh, you know, I mean, like Lacan said to the young analysts do crossword puzzles, I'd say, you know, for do, do etymology. I mean, you know, you really learn an incredible amount. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Are there any courses in psycholinguistics in this country? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm sure in some there departments. There must be. Yeah, that's the frontier. And it's, the not new, a, it's not a popular. The new frontier is neurolinguistics. Yeah, yeah, yeah the new Psycholinguistics. Frontier. Yeah. The late Lacan was very fascinated, to my understanding, with the neuro, neurolinguistics. Yeah very fascinated with this. They were really serious about making this into, quote unquote, a verifiable science. He, he was very, very much going this way at the end, you know, in a way. You probably know this better than me. I mean, I, I know about, you know, the attempts to the mathematical formalism and some of the people that were, you know, around that, that group, but, you know, and, and Baju, the, you know, and we'll talk about this later, we'll come back around to this. But Badiou, you know, is really talking about a mathematical ontology. I think he does this because of Lacan's attempt to mathematically formalize the unconscious. I mean, Zizek doesn't have the ability to do this, but um, Badiou may, you know. But yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just going to yeah. say, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously I'm a big lover of the Greeks, but <laughs> also taking from the Jewish tradition, right. of, you know, that the analyst sits behind. Yes, uh, the it's good point. Yeah, yeah. So it's listening. It's in a way to stop identification. This the visual sense. Yes, and to and to go through language. You know, so it's yes. the voice of God. There's a sense of again going back to uh, the Bible. Right. Um, you know, the the I. I mean, you know, Freud is very. Uh, one could say almost. 
press or or you know his whole relationship to his Jewish past and how he brings it in and later on he comes later on to acknowledge it much more but you know he's trying to keep psychoanalysis from being in a sense stigmatized uh, by its Jewish origins um, but you know the fact just for me it's a great visual easy kind of shorthand uh, but that the analyst sits behind so that he doesn't so or she doesn't um, have this identification with the analysand it's it's coming through the voice through language right. it's that thing about right. everything comes through language right and listening through the ear um, not through the eye right exactly yeah I mean, to go back to, um, you know, just for a second to this whole uh, chart with uh, 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 Lacan, uh, you know, in, in some ways, the causes of desire that he, he called the causes of desire were void, voice, the gaze, and the phallus. These were the four causes of desire. So when you begin to think about desire, the first thing is we're live lack. We're the, it's the void. You know, we're always stuck between live lack, right? And that's the structure, if you will, of need and de desire and need. You know, it's really in the space of the lack of being or lived lack, right, in, in some ways. And then, of course, as you say, the voice. And this is where the speaking subject, and his mo uh, I guess you know, Lacan was an incredibly good oral presenter, right? He did not write texts for publication. <laughs> You know, in fact, most of the texts, and I mean, maybe I have a bit of schizophrenia. I can I can follow along sometimes, but they read like schizophrenic texts. Oh God! I mean, you know, really, to be honest, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, not the four fundamental concepts because he's trying to elaborate and construct and what is theory. But when you read a creed, some of these things, it's, it really reads like you know. And, and he says, "I'm just a poem being written." And this is interesting. I mean, you know, when you really think about it, that's very Heideggerian in a sense, that I am, I am the open vessel through which this language is passing, right, <laughs> in some ways. So, yeah, so he has this, you know, constantly going on. So he's meant for the speaking, uh, for the speaking subject, right? I mean, this is really what it's about, this oral tradition in many ways, you know. So in a way, he, you know, the debate between him and uh, Derrida is that they, um, you know, um, um, you know, one is about the written, one is about the spoken, and uh, you know, it's it plays out in a way over the over the over the, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in French, uh, you know, uh, 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 academic politics and an academic uh, verbiage too, uh, ad infinitum, in some ways, but yeah. So the speaking subject. So yeah, you're right about the gaze. The gaze is not to be, you know, the gaze is not really a direct eye to eye or, you know, yeah. The gaze is something very different than that. And, 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 and uh, yeah. And different than the look. You know, this is another distinction we can talk about in terms of specularity, you know, in the specular relations because uh, the look you know, is, is, is different. That's part of the, what Sartre would call sadomasochistic activity that goes on between you and the other, you know, between the, 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 the I and the, and the other, if you will. Uh, but for Lacan, the gaze is much more, you know, a much greater <laughs> encompassing thing. But I think he picks up a lot of that from Merleau-Ponty, you know, and, uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So, um, Anyway, um, so um, yeah, let's, let's let's go back to this. So this is about the censor censorship. The mental act activity is unconscious, and um, the um, uh, belongs to the system. It's upon the scrutiny of the censorship it is rejected and not allowed to pass into the second phase. It is then said to be repressed and must remain unconscious. So we, we live in very obviously repressed times, right? I mean, this is no, no question about it. I mean, you know, this is re really where we are. We have repressed the whole history of the left. We have repressed the whole history of the psychoanalytic movement, <coughs> you know, the critiques against it. You know, obviously this is what we have really been living through in terms of what Stiegler calls, you know, knowledge and stupidity and the state of shock right. that we're living right. in. Really, in a way, it is this kind of epoch of, of, of repression. And not, you know, and, 
And, and part of it, you know, is a very different kind of repression because nobody's experiencing it because of the machines, right? Again, the, all these filters, the screen culture, if you will, that we're constantly in the screen culture. Nobody goes to the, I mean, I, I tell people, let's go to the movies. Oh, no, we can just watch it at home. We can put it on the Internet. You know, we can get it on the Internet. Nobody wants to go out to the, you know, you know, the social activity is, is, is disappearing, unless it's hype to, you know, nth degree. And, and there are plenty yeah. of good movies. Something yeah. like Green Book. Oh, okay. Only three people. <laughs> Agnes, <laughs> Varda. <laughs> Agnes Varda died yesterday. Yeah. That's the I end know. of an epoch. Uh, uh, Godard is uh, still alive. Of, uh, of the whole generation, it's only Jean-Luc Godard. That's uh, very unfortunate. Yeah, 90 years old she died yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, the second phase we call the consciousness capable of entering consciousness, and then he goes on to, in certain conditions, becomes the object of consciousness, right? In consideration of this capacity to become conscious, we will call the system consciousness the preconscious. If it should turn out that a certain censorship also determines whether the preconscious becomes conscious, we shall discriminate more sharply between the systems PCS and CS. For the present, let it suffice to bear in mind that the system PCS shares the characteristics of consciousness and that the rigorous censorships exercise its office at the point of transition from the unconscious to the preconscious or to conscious. So, for the acceptance, by accepting the existence, and you can see Freud, I mean, excuse me, Sartre reading this too, you know, because Sartre's going to say, you know, how does the censor know? <laughs> this is really what he asked, this question of it. Because Sartre's obviously coming out of the tradition of the Husserlian, you know, uh, theories and systems of consciousness. Sartre said that the unconscious does not exist, you know, in a, in a way. He's arguing, though, and being in nothingness against a very, uh, very pale uh, French psychoanalytic uh, community at that time. You know, I mean, not Lacan for example, with others. Okay, so anyway, it's departed a step further from the descriptive psychology of, of consciousness and has taken to itself a new problem and a new content. So this is, you know, Freud's way, again, of taking on the psychology and the dis descriptive psychology of the 19th century, you know? Again, James, through the science. James, that kind of stuff. Well, James is later. James is in the pragmat pragmatist school yeah, in the yeah. United States. I mean, he's talking about Wundt in some ways. I don't know how much he knew of the Gestalt uh, uh, people, but he would say that that might be powerful, but it's not ultimately, you know, yeah. And Gestalt was very active among the left here, by the way, you know, as you know, Paul Goodman in particular, mm. uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, useful uh, uses of Gestalt uh, uh, therapy and, and, and this. But, you know, we can go back and see, you know, if there's some kind of mergers or some kind of overlap between those. But anyway, so the, 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 um, the, the, um, the uh, thing that he has against, and I, I think this is true maybe if you argue against Sartre, is that what Freud's setting up here is a very different dynamics of the mind, too. You know, he says here in the next paragraph, this, this is, you know, it d differed from academic descriptive psychology mainly by reason of its dynamic conception of mental processes. We have to add that it professes to consider mental topography also and indicate in respect of any given mental operation within what system or between what systems it runs its course. This attempt has won the name of depth psychology, but which you'd be dare, bear in mind that it must be further amplified by yet another aspect of the subject. So then he goes on to acts of ideation. And th this is interesting to me, and this is where, if you're interested in this debate, the Freud-Jung, it's really in terms of the acts of ideation that a lot of this is taking place, where the development of the archetype in, in Jung, the development of, you know, the platonic, I mean, to me, uh, Carl Jung is ultimately uh, Pla Plato's theories of forms transferred into psychology. You know, the analytical, the archetypes yeah, yeah. and other I, things I you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, 
is transferred, when a metal act and confined to the acts of ideation, is transferred from the system unconscious into the system conscious or preconscious, or we suppose that this transposition involves a fresh registration comparable to a second record of the idea in question, situated moreover in a fresh locality in the mind and side by side by which the original unconscious record continues to exist. Or are we rather to believe that this transformation consists in a change in the idea, right? In the state of idea involving the same material and occurring in the same locality. This question may appear abstruse, but it must be put if we are to wish to form a more definite conception of mental topography or of the depth dimension in the mind. It is difficult because it goes beyond, quote, pure psychology. So he's beginning to differentiate through topography psychoanalysis from descriptive uh, psychology and depth psychology and touches on the relations of the mental apparatus to anatomy. We know that a rough correlation of this sort exists. Research has afforded irrefutable proof that mental activity is bound up with the function of the brain as with that of no other organ. The discovery of the unequal importance of the different parts of the brain and their individual relations to particular parts of the body and intellectual activity takes us a further step, but we don't know how big a step. But every attempt to deduce from these facts a localization of mental processes, every endeavor to think of ideas as stored up in nerve cells and of excitations as passing along nerve fibers, has completely miscarried. The same fate would await any doctrine which attempted to recognize, let us say, the anatomical position of the system consciousness mental activity in the cortex and to lo localize the unconscious processes in the uh, subcortical parts of the brain. Here's a hiatus which at present cannot be filled, nor is it one of the tasks of psychology to fill it. Our mental topography has for the present nothing to do with anatomy. So again, arguing against the dominant <laughs> thing, phrenology, right? Mm -hmm. Skull size, cortex size, locating lesions in the brain, you know, in the brain, etc. So he's kind of becoming the anti-dominant neurologist here, you know, of, of that period in terms of developing this new science too. So it is con concerned not with anatomical, <laughs> but with regions in the mental apparatus, irrespective of their possible situation in the body right, the regions, right? In this respect, our work is untrammeled and may proceed according to its own requirements. So you see the beginning here of developing the topography, just to give you an idea of how Freud works, right? First, the justification of why a science of the unconscious is needed, why it exists, right? Secondly, how do we go about constructing a topography, right? And he's doing so under this three, this three-pronged system of UCS, PCS and CS, right? These are the three, you know, yeah. Which ultimately, as a lot of you know, uh, you know, uh, and Melanie Klein reduces this to ego and id, <laughs> right? Ultimately, you know, she'll take just the ego and the id as part of part of this, or just, you know, <laughs> yeah, conscious, unconscious, right? <laughs> or in some cases, pre-conscious and conscious, right? In, in a lot of ways. So th this is interesting in that way. Okay, the former of the two follows the, the conscious phase of an idea implies a fresh record of it, which must be localized every way, is doubtless the cruder, but the more convenient. The second assumption, that of a merely functional change of state, is a priori more probable, but it is less plastic, less easy to handle. With the first, or typographical, typographical assumption, is bound up with that of a topographical separation of the systems, right? So you need this separation of conscious and unconscious, and the possibility that an idea may exist simultaneously in two parts of the mental apparatus, right? Yeah. I think I'm a communist, but maybe I'm not, you know, something like that, right? <laughs> Indeed, that it is not inhibited by the sensory. You know what my mother said the first time they told me he should go to a, a, a psychiatrist, huh? I don't care if he's a communist, I want a healthy communist. <laughs> That's a good mother, at least in that part she was good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't give a shit, you know, I want a healthy one. <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, okay, so, and also the possibility that an idea exists simultaneously two parts, indeed, that if it's not inhibited 
by the censorship, and this is where I guess you could start talking about, you know, the censor as gatekeeper. Is this a thing of inhibition rather than just letting know what what to come in and what not to come in? That Fro that Sard never really spoke about inhibitions, anxieties, and symptoms, you know, in, in that way when he dealt with this movement between unconscious and, and pre-conscious and pre-conscious and conscious. Um, anyway, it regularly advances from the one position to the other, possibly without its first location or record being abandoned. This may seem odd, but it can be supported by observation, and this is Freud again all the time from psychoanalytic practice. Remember, 1915, they've got a long track record going here, right? The practice has gone on. If we communicate to a patient some idea which he had one time repressed, but which we have discovered in him, you know, and of course the, the problem of suggestibility and suggesting, you know, the idea to be carried forward, telling him makes at first no change in the mental condition. Oh, I never thought about that. Or, you've got to be crazy, right? You know, you know, you know the Joni Mitchell song, uh, my analyst told me I was out of my head. You know that one? Two heads are better than one. You know, you know that old. <laughs> anyway, uh, above all, it does not remove the repression nor undo its effects, as might perhaps be expected from the fact that the previously unconscious idea has now become conscious. On the contrary, all that we shall achieve at first will be a fresh rejection, a resistance, right? A rejection of the repressed idea. You know, and this is Freud really at, at you know at some of his best in my my my. At this point, however, the patient has an actual fact: the same idea in two forms in <laughs> two separate localities. The patient doesn't know this, but the analyst supposedly does, right? And in the mental apparatus, first he has the conscious memory of the auditory, going back to the voice impression of the idea conveyed in what we told him. Right, what we conveyed. And secondly, and side by side with this, he has, as we know for certain, the unconscious memory of his actual experience existing in, in its earlier form. So we have here this dual movement always going on. Right? Okay. So now in reality, there is no lifting of the repression until the conscious idea after overcoming the resistances, has united with the unconscious memory trace. And this is very, very important, the memory trace. Right? Only through bringing the latter itself into consciousness is the effect achieved. On superficial consideration, this would seem to show that conscious and unconscious ideas are different and topographically separated records of the same content. But a moment's reflection shows that the identity of the information given to the patient very important, with his own repressed memory is only apparent. To have listened to something and to have experienced something are psychologically two different things, even though the content of each may be the same. Okay? All right. So for the moment, we're not able to decide between the two possibilities that we've discussed. Perhaps later on, and this is typical Freud, you know, we haven't come to a, a final conclusion. We need to explore some more. Perhaps later on, we'll come to certain factors, turn the balance in favor. We discover our question was not sufficiently comprehensive and the difference between a <laughs> conscious and an unconscious idea has to be defined quite otherwise. Okay, so now the next section is on the affects. And this is where uh, people such as uh, Deleuze and Guattari take their point of departure, you know, this whole question of affect theory. Yeah, and that's where a lot of them begin. Yeah, you, you're nodding yet, yeah, you're, you know, um, the affect, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I don't really have anything to Yeah, oh. it's, um, yeah. Uh, a lot of Jack's work was out of... Uh, oh, Jack Braddock Jack, you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, links to it, but anyway. Um, yeah. So there are a couple of people in my department who are writing dissertations on um, affect and media as well. Okay, so, interesting. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the whole thing about a a affect here. Um, um, the original affect is always with the emotion unconscious, right? You're unconsciously angry at this this person. This is he says this at the bottom of 136. Uh, he, he goes through um, two. I mean 126. My apologies. The two cases are not really on, on all fours to begin with. It may happen an affect or an emotion is perceived but misconstrued, right? 
who by the repression of its proper presentation is forced to become connected with another idea and is now interpreted by consciousness as the expression of this other idea. If we restore the true connection, we call the original affect unconscious, although the affect was never unconscious, but its ideational presentation, very important, had undergone repression. Right? In any event, the use of such terms as unconscious affect and emotion has reference to the fate undergone in consequence of repression by the quantitative factor in the instinctive impulse, probably the drive impulse, but I'll, 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 look, I have this in German, so I'll look and see the German. I don't read it in German, but I can at least pick up on the vocabulary. We know that an affect must be subjected to three different vicissitudes. Either it remains wholly or in part as it is, the affect, or it is transformed into a qualitatively different charge of affect, above all into anxiety, right? Or it is suppressed, i.e. its development is hindered altogether. Not repressed, but suppressed. Submerged, right? Yeah. Okay. These possibilities may perhaps be studied more easily in the technique of the dream work than in actually the treatment of the neurosis itself. We know, too, that to suppress the development of affect is the true aim of repression. I can't be you know, experiencing this, I can't be, you know, this is too much anxiety for me, I have to take flight, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're going to read Escape from Freedom in the other uh, course, you know, that's really, again, you know, maybe Eric Fromm couldn't take Frieda from Freichmann any, or from uh, Reichman anymore, you know, that's the joke on that book that I've mentioned, you know, fear of freedom is really fear, flight from Frieda, yeah, <laughs> right, anyway. Um, Anyway, the suppression of the development of act is the true aim of repression and that its work does not terminate if this aim is not achieved. In every instance where repression has succeeded in inhibiting the development of affect, we apply the term unconscious to those affects that are restored when we undo the work of repression. So it cannot be denied that the use of the terms and questions is logical, but a comparison of the unconscious affect with the unconscious idea reveals the significant difference that the unconscious idea continues after repression as an actual formation in the unconscious system. Okay? As an this is very materialistic. By I mean, you know, you can really, when you really begin to read this carefully, you know, you begin to see the level of the psychic materiality that he's dealing with and now he's working with it, you know, this, these, these levels of, uh, you know, uh, of, of the theory. It's, it's amazing to me, you know. Again, why I, I think Lacan's absolutely correct. I'm not Lacanian, I'm Freudian. Yeah, that's what he said. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Lacanian. You may be, he tells his, his students and his, his uh, disciples, whatever, but, you know, he says, I'm a Freudian, right? So, you know, going back to read this, you're always gathering something new to really work out. And, and, and uh, uh, yeah. So, anyway, um, so it cannot be denied that the use of terms logical comparison un continues actual formation in the system unconscious. While to the unconscious affect, there corresponds in the same system only a potential disposition which is prevented from developing further. Right? Yeah. This is too much, right? It's got to be inhibited. I have to take flight from this, et cetera, right? Instead of this undergoing of the, of the anxiety. So that, strictly speaking, although no fault be found with the mode of expression in question, there are no unconscious affects in which there are unconscious ideas, right? But there may very well be in the system unconscious affect formations which, like others, come into consciousness. The whole difference, and this is important, this, this sentence, the, the whole difference arises from the fact that ideas are cathexises. And I think this new translation is investments instead of cathected. Uh, I think this is being used, invested energy rather than cathected energy. But anyway, ultimately of memory traces, while affects and emotions correspond with processes of discharge. So you have two systems at work here, right? One of which, right? <coughs> is the psychic investments, very materially low, right? And the other, the emotions, right? And the affects themselves are with processes of discharge. Okay? okay? And the final expansion of which is perceived as feeling, 
you know, you know how people say, I feel a certain way. They're speaking in two registers, according to Freud at least, right? The register of the, of the cathexis, or the investments, and also in the register of discharge. This is part of it. You have a question? No, investments is kind of different than, uh, to me, it's a... Than cathected? Yeah. Okay. Because one is a, isn't one is a sort of a fixation, where investments is, seems different than that to me. Well, maybe. I mean, I don't know. This is the new... I, I don't know what the German term is. I'm mm. sorry. I, I, it's interesting. Know, I don't have that ready to hand, but yeah. This is the Strachey translation, and there are people who somewhat critique this as mm. do we need this language of cathected energy. Cathected is in, a prehension. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Whereas uh, investment seems to be not so much that. I uh, guess so. Yeah, it says uh, the concentration of mental energy on one particular person, idea, or on right, right. So I guess there could be investments. Right. I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look mm. again and see what the, the term term is. But I there's been be a kind of problem of translation. Yeah. 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 I, I think it might be Bezetsin. I'm not totally sure. It might be what? Bezetsin. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's actually a very normal German word. Yeah, it is a normal German word. Yeah. You know, I mean, like taking up a, posi a, a kind of a position almost. Yeah, something huh? like that. Like a strong position? Yeah, yeah. Like cathism. Yeah, cathesimal. Yeah, yeah. Cathesis. Yeah, cathesis. Take the right. sit down. Yeah, yeah, the sit down. Take yeah, okay. Take All right. Place. Taking a position. Yeah, okay, okay. that's good. I All like right. that better. Maybe we'll just take taking a position or use the Greek, sit down. <laughs> right. right, sitting down. That's one of the things the Strachey translation did was to right. make it... Right. You know, Freud wrote a really easy to read. He's totally right. opposite. Yeah, my yeah, yeah. It's, right. it's like Kafka. It's really, from what I understand, yeah, yeah, it's true. really easy yeah, yeah. to read German if you yeah. know German. Yeah. Um, and then the Strachey translation, it 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 erases this difference between right. instinct and drive. The right. other thing is, it introduces these Latin words mm -hmm. uh, for where in the German it's really a, a, a everyday German mm -hmm. word. German word, right? So it again made it more medical in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'd yeah. rather have uh, Freud speaking Greek than Latin. <laughs> That's another thing, too. <laughs> yes, indeed. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can thank uh, Virginia and Leonard Wolf for this uh, translation, right? <laughs> They're the ones who gave Hogarth the rest the, uh, the go-ahead on this. And the Englishman, as uh, Freud used to refer to him, Ernest Jones, his uh, English uh, representative. Uh, actually, Welsh. Huh, he's Welsh? Oh, Jones was Welsh? But he was in London all the time, wasn't he? Wasn't he in London for a good part of the time? Didn't he get Freud to London? I mean, wasn't he positioned in a way to... He was the one who actually got Freud to London, right? Yeah, he, yeah. Was, he, he was basically the liaison with the English-speaking world. Right, right, right. Yeah, he was definitely He was Welsh, Welsh in, in and background? Okay. Being an outsider yeah. too, and I think oh, I see, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Interesting, okay, yeah. All right, um, all right. So, so I mean, you know, this is an important part about affect, affect and discharge. You know, uh, it's very important in terms of uh, cathexes or sit down or mm -hmm. you know take a position <laughs> versus that of um, um, of, uh, of of discharge and um, affects and emotions. Right. So this is this is important for Freud very much. So, so. Um, the, uh, the conscious system controls activity and motility. So again, he wants to, um, he wants to uh, continue with his topography uh, in the next section. Uh, I know we're you know, kind of getting on to time here. Uh, the dynamics of repression, the border between the systems unconscious and preconscious. Um, uh, the important part here is in the unconscious, page 129, the repressed idea remains capable of action and must therefore have retained its sitting down, you know, its uh, cathexis. So it must be something else which has been withdrawn. Let us take the case of repression proper after hyphen expulsion, as it affects an idea which is pre-conscious or even has entered consciousness. Repression can consist here only in the withdrawal from the idea of the pre-conscious cathexis which belongs to the system pre-PCS. 
The idea that it remains without consensus which seems, I mean, I liked investment here because you get remains without investment or without being able to sit down, right? Uh, re re receives investment from the unconscious, you know, a charge, right, mm -hmm. if you will, or, you know, um, real energy, right, in a sense. Um, receives cathexis, right, um, from the unconscious or retains the unconscious cathexis which it had previously held. We have therefore withdrawal of the preconscious, retention of the unconscious, or substitution of an unconscious for a preconscious cathexis. We notice, however, that we, moreover, that we have unintentionally, as it were, based these reflections on the assumption of the transition of the system from the system unconscious to the system near to it. It is not affected through the making of a new record, but through a change in its state. Right? This is interesting. Again, I mean, for those of you when we did the being in time, to me this is like mood. You know, this is like Bestimmung. You know, he's really looking at this in terms of, uh, you know, the attention, the attentionness, attentiveness here, right? And an alteration, right, in its cathexis. The functional hypothesis is easily routed the topograph. But this process of withdrawal of libido does not suffice to make comprehensive with us another characteristic of repression. It is not clear why the idea which has retained its cathexis or received cathexis from the unconscious should not, in virtue of its cathexis, renew the attempt to penetrate into the system preconscious. The withdrawal of libido will then have to be repeated and the same performance will recur interminably, but the result would not be repression. In the same way, the mechanism just discussed of withdrawal of preconscious cathexis would fail to explain the process of primal repression. For here we have to consider an unconscious idea which has yet received no cathexis from the preconscious and therefore cannot be deprived of it. What we're looking for is another process which maintains the repression in the first case and in the second ensures it's being established and continued. Other processes we can only find in the assumption of an anti-cathexis, right? By means of which the system preconscious guards itself against the intrusion of the unconscious idea. We shall see from clinical examples how an anti-cathexis established in the system, PCS, uh, manifesto. Let me just mention a couple of other things and we'll go on to this, uh, you know, we'll continue with this and the record next time, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we should take at least two weeks with this stuff because Definitely. the record is uh, very good alongside of this, the placing of him and the interpretive model. But at least this gives us a sense of the, again, the science of the unconscious, the terminology, what he's really trying to do, and, you know, what value does this have for us, you know, both politically and, you know, in our own, <laughs> you know, uh, trans-individuation or individuating processes today, et cetera. Uh, sans uh, $300 an hour on Park Avenue or whatever, uh, whatever. All right, in anxiety hysteria, this is a term that he finally brings up, anxiety hysteria, a preliminary phase of the process is preliminary, perhaps indeed it's really admitted on careful observation it can be clearly discerned. It consists in anxiety appearing without the subject knowing of what he's afraid of, okay? This is interesting, right? This is the beginning of anxiety hysteria, and we can talk about hysterical conversion and other things like that as well. Okay, so and he's gonna go through phases, maybe we can leave it at this term, anxiety hysteria, the anticathexis has to lead to a substitute formation, how this works, right? The flight from anxiety, you know, um, in, in a way, how how the analysis or in the analytic encounter that the flight uh, takes place. And then um, 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 the, uh, the, the system, the characteristics on page uh, 134, just to, to highlight this a little bit where we can go next time and I'll, I'll remember this. Uh, the system unconscious, that the process is only under the, the uh, conditions of dreaming and of neurosis, right? Both the dream work or the neurotic on the count. And as some of you may remember the beginning of, um, of the um, <coughs> anti-Oedipus, uh, the, the argument of the anti-Oedipus is, is that the neurotic on the couch is no longer the model. You know, it's really the schizophrenic on the walk. This is the term in, you know, in the anti-psychiatry movements and all of that. 
So we can talk about that as well. But let's get the Freud down, you know, before we go too far ahead. But, you know, the, the neurotic on the couch is what Freud is, you know, and as I mentioned last, last week, you know, his real stroke of genius, and to my mind, historically, there are many strokes of genius, but historically is that he took the madness of the 19th century of the asylum and he brought it to one room on his couch, right? He was able to do that. Mm -hmm. He actually transformed, <laughs> you know, madness into the speaking subject on the couch from that of, you know, all the asylums in the 19th century. So in a way, this is a major advance in the history of, the, you know, mental life and, uh, and, and the treatment of, uh, of, of disorders. So anyway, so we'll go, we'll go through that, the processes, the neurotic, and then the communication, the last uh, two phases, uh, parts of this, the communications between the pre-conscious and, and the unconscious, very important to remember. And, uh, you know, you, you all know the topography that he develops, the id, the ego, and the superego. This is very basic, you know, and he maps out these, uh, these moments. Uh, Lacan says there's no superego at a certain point. I mean, it's just ego and id, and he's picking this up from Klein in the 50s, in her, her work. Um, um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about that as well. Um, fantasy, cooperation between the two systems, and then finally the recognition of the unconscious and uh, uh, hypochondriac uh, language, as well as uh, the work of, um, of um, Victor Tosk, who I mentioned last week, is also in this on the schizophrenic. So we can talk about that as well. Okay? And then we'll do the yeah, record too. Listen, be careful. Uh, look at your emails. I may not be here, but I'll let everybody know by Monday. And we'll just pick up. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah, yeah. make it up the following the week. And I was wondering, it's, are people available on, on a Friday uh, uh, early evening? Yeah, I am uh, just wondering. This, early evening? Like like 6 o'clock or 7? Yeah. I'm thinking that we have the historical material in some conference, which I got railroaded into doing. <laughs> but anyway, um, 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 is uh, Saturday in two weeks. So. Uh, I'm just wondering, do people have Friday uh, evening, like at seven, seven o'clock, or or another day of the week? I'm mean, I'm just wondering. Yeah. It depends. It depends, yeah. huh? Okay, I'll, I'll I'll send out an email about all of this and, and the reading. If you want to go ahead, I know this is you know this is a lot. I mean you know it's a lot to digest. It's systematic and very much uh, you know Freud at his best but if you want to go ahead the next reading will be on narcissism and I'll try to relate it back to Lacan you know and what he does with the mirror stage yeah but the record again the first part of the placing of Freud which I think is very good especially on symbols you know he's very good on the the reflection of symbol symbols and then the second part will be on the epistemological foundation here um, 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 so we'll, we'll go over that too. Okay, good. All right. So happy uh, repressions or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or Josh, are you going to put the narcissism? Yeah. Yeah. Up on the. Yeah.